Hello everyone, I'm Joy with EO Global Learning. Learning. Thank you for joining today. If you have any questions, remember to type them in that Q&A tab on the left. Uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Scheman, who was once considered least likely to succeed. Robert overcame severe learning disabilities and seemingly overwhelming odds to become the founder of this Scheman organization, author of over 16 New York Times best-selling books, and to teach many hardworking people to attain total financial freedom for life, even though they had no investment experience, no financial savvy, and little to no money in the bank. Additionally, he is passionate in educating at-risk te teens and college-age youth, and had created a specialized school concentrating on finance and achieving goals. Today, Robert will lead you through what it takes, you, what it takes to get your point across successfully, create agreement in your business, and sales endeavors. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Robert, and thank you for joining us, Robert. Thank you, Joy, and welcome everybody, and congratulations to all y'all being here. And uh, my goal in the next uh, 57 minutes is to give you some amazing persuasion tools that you can use that will work uh, for your business, increase your revenues, your uh, productivity, your efficiency, and uh, your general success. And uh, I want to commend all of you. I'm an entrepreneur also for being part of this uh, great group. Um, the EO, uh, because uh, as business owners, uh, I think it's one of our best sources of information to get together and share ideas. And um, we're going to have a very fun, very snappy presentation for you. And what I want to do is uh, one of my famous books is called How Come That Idiot's Rich and I'm Not. But tonight and today, you're going to learn How Come That Idiot's a Great Negotiator and I'm Not. Um, some of you have seen me on uh, CNN and Fox uh, where I'm a wealth expert. But what a lot of people don't know about me besides the books and business and life and uh, coaching is that I was a diplomat uh, in South America for many, many years for an international human rights group, and uh, I was um, a negotiator uh, in uh, very difficult situations all over Latin and South America. has been trained in all aspects. And I'm going to share some of those uh, techniques with you. Some are not public anywhere, and they also definitely apply to your business. So uh, we're going to talk about persuasion and negotiation. And a couple of ground rules um, to get going. Uh, number one, it's okay to have a little fun. Uh, number two, just like you, I go to webinars and seminars all the time, and I want information I can use uh, this uh, week, tomorrow, uh, that will help me uh, with my productivity. And that's what I'm going to do for everyone on this uh, uh, call this evening for you. I'm actually uh, talking to you from the uh, state of Israel where I've done some seminars and uh, television uh, interviews, and then uh, tomorrow I'll be in New York and then Miami. So it's a real pleasure to be with you, and uh, it's all about you and making you an amazing uh, persuade, uh, persuader. So I see you, Intention and Commitment University. I'm going to challenge you right now and say that every communication that you make is some type of persuasion, even the hello, how you doing in the morning is a type of communication. And as you know, your revenue, your success will be a reflection of your ability to communicate. Um, so what I want to ask you is before every meeting, before every uh, communication that's important to you, uh, what is your intention? And if you get nothing else out of this presentation, here it is. Before your phone call, before your meeting, what is the clear, concise intention? I want the contract signed. I want these uh, four salespeople to leave uh, uh, recommitted. Uh, I want to get this uh, vendor online for whatever it is. I want to get my employees uh, motivated. So just imagine from this moment forward that before every communication, you set um, an intention, clear and concise. Even for those five or ten minute phone calls, uh, I want to uh, get an agreement. I want to set a meeting. I want to get the contract signed. Uh, if you'll do just that, I know all of you are super busy. You're, you're very successful in your own right, like Charlie and Bonnie and Anthony and Andrew and Dan. You know, all of you are very successful. You must get thousands of emails a week, uh, tons of meetings and phone calls. But to take that breath and set that commitment will make a huge difference. Now, how do you become an expert negotiator? My job is in the next 57 minutes is to do that. And in a few minutes, I'm going to give you two systems uh, that you can use either one or both that are highly effective. And what's interesting, all of us were the best negotiators at one time. We all were children. And if any of you have ever been around 7 to 12-year-olds, you know that they're some of the best negotiators in the world. Now, you've been to all the seminars, read the books, uh, had the consultants come in. Some of you are saying in just a minute, wait, wait a minute, Robert, I might have heard some of this before. My question to you is, 
some of you uh, this you may know and some of you never heard before, but are you good at it? So my challenge is to you is take this information, don't think, don't worry, don't analyze it, just use it, apply a couple of those simple principles you're going to learn uh, and see if it works. I'd also like to ask you uh, to ask any questions. Uh, at the end, I'm going to uh, do what I call some interventions, but if you uh, have a topic or something you've wondered about persuasion, I'm a master hypnotist, neurolinguistic programmer, uh, trained in body language, handwriting analysis, all kinds of stuff which I'll share with you uh, in just a few minutes. But if you have any questions whatsoever or a topic that you're interested in, uh, please let me know, and we will do our very best, my very best, to take care of it. Now, uh, a lot of you know this. Uh, the most important part of persuasion, communication, negotiation is building rapport. They don't like you. They probably won't. And a lot of you probably have a lot of people that have worked with you in the past or maybe working with you now who maybe aren't that good at what they do, but people just like them, and they get a lot of stuff done. So uh, in a few moments, we're going to talk about rapport building. Uh, we'll do it right now if you'd like, and how to build instant rapport. I believe the mind communicates uh, on four different levels. Most um, people communicate on level one, which is task, okay? That's task communication. Hey, what are you doing? Is a report there? What are you doing tomorrow? Have you picked up the laundry? I've got to take the kids out, whatever it is. Not very interesting. Level two communication, and I'm going to give you some instant rapport builders uh, right here at level three and four, is uh, what we uh, want other people to think about us. We want to look good. We want to impress them. It's natural. It's okay. Not very interesting. Don't learn much. A deeper level in the mind to, sub to the subconscious is level three communication. It's our deep passions and drivers, our values, core values. But we don't want to really talk about them because people may not um, uh, appreciate us so much. You know, I'd really like to retire, uh, move to the beach in Costa Rica and just surf, but I don't want to tell anyone that. They might not think I'm motivated anymore or tell my parents that. So level four communication is what really drives us our core values that comes out in language. So let me give you a practical example. Instead of asking how are you or what do you do when we meet most people at a new meeting, uh, what's your name, what do you do, how are you, instead of asking what do you do, why don't you step back and take a moment, if appropriate, and by the way, this is a buffet. You pick and choose what you like and what you're going to use. Um, it all does work, is this. What do you find most fulfilling? What do you find most interesting about what you do? And when you ask someone that question, they're going to stop, look up to the left or right, take a break from their automatic behavior, and probably give you an interesting answer that's going to open a key to what really drives them. Um, what do you find most interesting, most fulfilling about what you do? They're going to stop and say, you know, I love to help people. Uh, I'm in it for the um, challenge. Uh, so uh, building rapport, let them talk. Uh, ask them questions. Uh, people's favorite subject course themselves, you know this, but are you doing it? Uh, that's all about building rapport. Now, we're going to reduce most resistance in all your persuasions and negotiations, and the way we're going to do that is one way is stop falling into the talking crab trap. As you can tell, I'm a talker. When I'm negotiating something serious, all I do is listen and watch and ask questions. Now, you've got to be reasonable and fair and authentic, but in a serious negotiation, our job is to gather information, not give out so much. So we want to ask open-ended questions, uh, get them to talk, okay? Now, a lot of you heard that showing up is 90%. That is absolutely not true. In any serious negotiation with a vendor, supplier, employee, sales, spouse, or whatever, be prepared. The more information you have, what they do, what they like, who they are, and, of course, now uh, I know a lot of you run from meeting to meeting, conference call to conference call, but if you could take just a minute um, and look at uh, Facebook. Uh, a lot of people don't know this is CIA actually funded part of it. Great way to find out about people, what their hobbies are, what their interests are. And that little difference of building that rapport or getting that information could literally set you apart from all your competition. So I want you to really be prepared, intelligence, okay? Now let's give you the two best negotiating systems in the world. It is happy hour. It is time for two for one. What I'd like to give you is a system that I don't believe is public. Um, it works on terrorists, vendors, clients, employees, spouses, and some children. Now, uh, I was involved in a very serious uh, negotiation down in uh, South America. We were stuck. Uh, my boss got someone from the uh, governmental agency, the CIA, on the phone with us. And they said, I'm going to give you this uh, system we use. It's very, very effective. 
But uh, Robert, you're not going to like it. And I'm going to tell you that you may not like it, and here's why. He told me the reason uh, you're not going to like it is it's too simple. But they use it, and I want you to practice this um, in the next uh, 10 days and see what happens. I've been using it for over a year after I learned it. It's highly effective, highly simple, and here it is. What you want to do in a, in a negotiation, of course, besides building rapport and being informed, is reduce resistance. Right now as I'm speaking, a lot of you are re resisting. It's natural. You're busy. You've got to do uh, phone calls. Uh, is this call going to be worth it? There's resistance in almost any communication. So how do we reduce resistance? Now, number, uh, before number one, you always have to be authentic. Be yourself. Don't ever use a system that doesn't fit to you or, or make it your own. So here it is. Before any negotiation, after we build rapport and gather information, I tell the person, listen, you're in complete control. Whether you sell this house or, or not or, or sign this deal or fund our business or take this job, it's 100% up to you. Now, when you say it and mean it, you can actually see them relax because most negotiations are about, let me tell you what you need to do and order them around. All you're going to do is invite resistance. So number one is tell them and mean it that you're in control. The decision is 100% you. And this is true. There's only one person that can convince anybody of anything, and that's you. When we try to really convince other people externally, we're going to get resistance. How would you like it if that resistance was reduced 60 to 90%? Number two in this negotiating system, ask them, what's the main benefit for you and your company to sign the contract, build this relationship, take this job? What's really the main benefit for you? Now, when you ask this question, who's talking? You're not convincing. They're telling you. Listen to core values, core words, core persuaders. Now, number three, here begins the bomb. On a scale of one to ten, one being no motivation or low motivation, ten being super motivated, how motivated are you to uh, sign this contract? Uh, uh, become our vendor, uh, develop a relationship, take the job, clean your room if it's a child, right? Now, CIA studies show that we as business people love to use our logic, but most people, 99% of communication and decisions are emotion-based. The CIA studies told us that if they say an 8 or 9 or 10, uh, most of them are fluffers, talkers. They're not doers. There's exceptions, of course. But if they say 2, 3, or 4, they actually – might be a lot more motivated than you think. So if they say three, don't panic. The next question is the bomb. Whatever number they say, well, I think I'm a four on the motivation scale, you know, below average. Then you ask them, why didn't you say three? If they say three, you ask them, why didn't you say two? Now think about this. You stop. Silence is one of the best negotiating tools in the world. And they're going to search for an answer and give it to you. Well, I really do want the job. I really do think there's a chance we can work together. And now, who's convincing who? They're having to convince themselves and you. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how motivated are you? Or 0 to 10 if you like. Whatever number they say, ask them, why don't you say a lower number? The next step, number 5, is go back to the main or uh, benefits to them. And remember, it's all about them. What benefit is it to them? And then... Talk about it. Develop it. The next step is very interesting. Ask them, what's the next step? What's the next step? Now, this has to be a real step. Remember, you set your intention. We need that contract signed today. We, we know why not. Uh, we need a commitment of some sort. That's your intention before the meeting. So if they say the next step is I need to go home and think about it, that's not a next step. Now, we're not saying people can't go home and, and, or go back to their office and have meetings but what's the real next step? What do we need to make this happen? But instead of you telling them what to do, you ask them, okay? So I um, want to give that system very quickly. Number one, they're in control. Tell them that. Mean it. Number two, um, ask them what's the main benefit for them. Number three, in a scale of one to ten, how motivated. Number four, uh, whatever number they say. Five, ask them why don't they say four and let them start convincing you and themselves. The next one is anchor back to the benefit. Um, and, of course, ask them what's the next step, having a real step. I'd like all of you all to practice uh, spouses, children, 
Um, it's a very interesting, very simple system. This is what some of our governmental agencies use. It really works. Now, let's give you another system. Um, if you want to use that one, great. But let's make it happy hour two for one. Remember, you are the best negotiator in the world. Now, let me explain this. I once went to one of the most advanced, expensive seminars on negotiation in the world. All the top diplomats, business negotiators there, I think it was like $20,000. And uh, the second day was in Toronto, Canada. We had to go to Toys R Us and watch four to 12-year-olds negotiate with their parents. Now, some of you may or may have not have children, but I know all of you have been around children. And if not, go to a Toys R Us because you at one time, you may not remember, were the best negotiator in the world, and you're going to learn a lot from the system. Now, um, if you've ever been around kids, nieces, nephews, friends, kids, your kids, whatever, um, you'll know uh, that these uh, children follow the system, and I'm going to break it down for you. You probably knew it, and you're going to use it because it works. The five-year-old almost always wins, okay? Almost always wins, okay? Um, okay, the five-year-old almost always wins. Here it is. I just lost my uh, – um, one second, please. I just lost my slide, but I'll be right I'll back, back to you. So five-year-olds, number one, what, you, what you, can you learn from them? Number one is their intention is absolutely unbelievable. They know that there's no way that they're going to hear that they're not going to get what they want. Does that make sense? Uh, and I want you to think about that. They uh, go in, they, do, they don't hear no. Now think about this. When you hear no, what happens, right? Uh, we get uh, defensive, we get upset. A five or seven-year-old, when they hear no, they don't even hear it. Um, and I know you know this, persistence is one of the keys that have gotten you to be so successful, but in negotiation, it's a very, very big key. Um, it was also uh, very interesting. We interviewed the five and seven year olds. Number one, they always asked for more. If they wanted a PlayStation, they asked for a few things. Um, they didn't hear no. Uh, and uh, we're, they're going to follow this system perfectly. So let's break it down for you. Number one, some advanced rapport building, correct? Now write this down and remember this. The less you care, the more you'll make. The first rule of negotiation is if you care too much, you're too emotionally involved, you'll make a mistake. Now, I'm not saying don't be passionate. I'm not saying um, don't care and don't be interested. But you really have to get over your emotions to be an excellent negotiator. Um, friends, family, work, uh, rapport building. Ask them questions. Uh, whenever I go into negotiation, the last thing I, I, I start with is the business. I think in any and every culture, no matter what we think, um, unless, of course, there's a personality type that is, you know, straight business, let's get to it. Now, let's talk a little about verbal martial arts. Um, whatever energy they use, you're going to use. A lot of tough, a lot of you have been in very tough negotiators, uh, maybe previously with a really tough boss or an associate or vendor who was really mean and brusque. And if you match their energy, right, usually they'll collapse. So if uh, you're talking to someone who's really rough, they're like, what would you call this meeting for and you're not delivering? And then you match them with the same energy. Well, what are, we, what are we in the meeting for? With the same verbal energy, usually they'll collapse. You could escalate it. Be careful. But we like to match energy, match breathing, match body language. A lot of you have heard this before, but the question is, are you doing it? Correct? So uh, the less you care, the more you'll make. Uh, go in there and uh, uh, develop a rapport uh, through matching. And you can do these exercises in the next couple of days. Just take a minute and match someone's breathing, match their body posture, and uh, see what happens. An instant rapport builder. We all like people like ourselves. Now, number two, we talked about this. Set your intention. We're getting the contract. They're going to become a customer. They're taking the job. Uh, I've been asked repeatedly why I've been one of the most successful negotiators, uh, uh, supposedly, in diplomacy in South America. And I don't think it's skill. I don't think it's luck. I think it's pure intention, just like that seven-year-old who knows they're getting the toy no matter what, and they can hear no 37 times, be threatened with anything, and they don't, it doesn't phase them. So what's your intention before that phone call, before that meeting? How committed are you to the result? Posturing. Now, we don't want to be jerks or have ego, 
but how are you um, presenting yourself? Um, the number one human motivator, I know all of you have studied uh, motivation, self-help, personal development. Very simple question. What's the number one human motivator in the world? It's fear of loss. Now, you always got to be honest. Uh, you got to be sincere and authentic, especially in today's market and world. But are you coming from a position of weakness or power? Now, one thing we always teach in negotiation is um, fear of loss. Listen, uh, we're talking to three uh, other uh, possibilities this week, and we're going to pick one. We're going to make a decision in the next seven days. Um, that triggers a very deep subconscious fear of loss, and even the most successful, powerful individuals, if you can put it in there, you need to come from a, a position of power, not of weakness. Uh, something else in this matter, take your biggest weakness, if the other, if, and you know what it is. Maybe you're not competitive on price. Um, but your service is amazing, and uh, uh, we like to immediately address that weakness up front. So to reduce the resistance, take the objection away, and make the weakness a strength. Um, I know when I was beginning in business, my weakness was no experience, um, no background, uh, and anyone I talked to, I said, listen, you probably know I have no experience, but I will tell you this, I will work harder than anybody because I, I really need this, I'm going to make it happen. So I want you to write this down and think about how can you uh, know your weakness going into four and make it into a strength. Uh, number four, as you know, all the seven-year-olds do this, ask for more. You know, if you're going in and asking for two things on a service contract, ask for four. You can always go less. It's hard to go more. Um, and I know this sounds uh, uh, kind of superficial, but it always seems uh, to work. Um, also, we want to break our negotiation down into sections. Don't mix them up. So in most negotiations, I'll uh, negotiate and teach you to negotiate first on price. That's all you do. Then once you get the right price in the contract, then number two, you can negotiate terms. Then just after terms, then you can do number three, what I call uh, maybe service points. Number four, other stuff. But always uh, ask for more. Not too much to be ridiculous, but it always does work. Now, this is a, not only a rapport builder, but a negotiation uh, uh, tactic. And this is how to disarm uh, people. You know, when, think about this. When you go into negotiation, how do you want the people? Do you want them stressed out? Do you want them on the defense? Uh, or do you want them really listening to you, uh, really present? So what I want you to do in the next uh, three or four days with your family, with your work, is pace people's reality. And this is a very big disarming um, statement. So what does it mean? You actually talk like you're talking out of their head. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say you go to a restaurant. We've all done this and had a bad, bad meal. You know, there's a cockroach the size of a small dog uh, that jumped out of your steak or, uh, you know, feathers on the chicken. And the first thing you do is you call the waitress over. And, of course, the waitress has no negotiating uh, power. And usually we're upset with her. Be careful because I've worked in restaurants. God knows what they'll do to the food back in the kitchen, okay? And here it is. Pace the reality. I know you're busy, okay? I know you got a lot of tables when the manager comes over. Um, I know uh, work here has been uh, challenging. Take a minute or two and talk like you're talking out of their eyes, out of their um, head, uh, whatever it is, a few statements. Uh, they'll, that makes them understand that you understand them. Uh, with your children, you can try. You know, I know your uh, school's been tough, and you've been very busy, and uh, you're a little stressed over this, and uh, you're wondering uh, when are we going to have dinner. Uh, try it. Put yourself out of your head into their head. Another way to really disarm them is actually disarm them. One of my favorite disarming statements in serious negotiations is this. You can use it, and, of course, always be honest. Listen, I'm really not that great at negotiating, which I don't – you know, in the scheme of things, maybe I'm not. I think that sometimes. And listen, I don't really like to negotiate. I know you probably don't like to negotiate either. So without negotiating, what's the least you take and be okay? I don't like to negotiate. I, don't wanna, I know you don't want to negotiate or waste time. Uh, listen, I'm not the best negotiator. I'm not the best cold caller. Uh, I'm not the greatest at sales. So without getting into all that, let's just get right to it. What's the best uh, you can do that will take care of your needs? and let's move on and go silent. So think of ways that you can diffuse, disarm. Uh, humor is always an excellent one, but the next part is very important. 
especially in today's market. As you and I know, the world has changed. Uh, you've got to ABA, not the American Bar Association. You've got to always be very authentic. Um, people right now, uh, if there's no authenticity, uh, they're going to be very suspicious in any negotiation. Now, here's something you know and you've heard, but are you doing it? The biggest mistake people make in a price, dollar, contract, number negotiation is this. They mention a number too soon and too large. Let me give you an example. Uh, I look at negotiation as just a system or process for gathering information. That's it. I want you to remember that. All communication and negotiation is, of course you want the result, you set your intention, and you want to use these tools, pick which ones you're going to use, but all negotiation is, is gathering information. I know a lot of you have uh, bought a house probably a couple times in your careers, in your life, or will. And uh, when you made an offer and they accepted the offer, whether it's a house, a contract, an employment agreement, when they accepted your offer, what's the only thing you learned? That you offered too much, right? That's it. So um, in most negotiations, I will ask for their number, uh, and we'll have to give you some uh, systems here to get the best number out of them very quickly. But I will almost always never mention a number unless I absolutely have to, and I'm going to do it very low as a test number, and if they get upset or it's ridiculous, I'll show you how to deal with that in just a minute by refraining. So the next step is this. Do you know their deep why? You know, uh, most things are emotional. Uh, believe it or not, even in business, they want to keep their job. Uh, they need the money. Uh, they're under pressure. And uh, I like to ask the question, why? Just like a five-year-old. So let's go back to that five- or seven-year-old negotiator that you were and that you've seen at the toy store or at your family gatherings. When mom says, you cannot have the PlayStation, what does the seven- or five-year-old always say? Why? Because I told you so. Why? Because I'm your mother. Why? Because I got with your father. Why? I'm kind of regretting it. How many times have you heard a child ask that question without um, – moving, uh, without uh, 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 giving up anything, without even flinching. How many times are you willing to get to the real why? Why did they come up with that price? Uh, why are they sticking with that number? Uh, why, why, why? you really got to ask most questions, and this is based on most psychological studies, three to seven times to get the real answer. Let me say that again. In a negotiation or almost any communication, most people – um, don't tell you the real reason until you've asked at least three times, usually five. In all of our negotiation scripts, we ask the same question a different way at least five times. I'll give you an example and prove it to you. A lot of you uh, walk in work, you see somebody you know, you know something's wrong. You see it on their face. You heard they're going through a rough time. Hey, Sarah, how you doing? What does Sarah always say? I'm okay. Sarah, uh, you know, second time. Uh, you look a little different. Is everything all right? How are you really doing? Second time, Sarah says, uh, I'm doing all right. I'm okay. Third time, Sarah, no, really. Is everything all right? Well, my husband left me. Uh, I'm losing my job. The IRS has got a million-dollar lien against me, on and on and on. But you know that the first time you ask the question, you don't really get the answer. So ask yourself, are you willing to ask that question? Why? Uh, a few different times to get the real answer. Now, my magic phrase for you, and I know you've heard this, but are you using it? is develop rapport. Let's review here a little bit. Um, ask their deep why. Why are you selling? Why are you buying? Why, 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 why? Gather all your information and uh, say uh, disarm them without uh, negotiating. I know you probably don't like to. We don't want to waste your time or mine. I'm not very good at it. What's the least uh, you to do this for? Uh, and, and go silent. And maybe they came down from $800,000 to 750000 and then you pause, take your time, relax. Um, and by the way, really negotiation is just state management, not managing Georgia or Tennessee or a country, but emotional state. So before you go into negotiation, a couple rules. Let's uh, bring you up to speed here for all of us. Is Number one, what kind of state do you want them in? Whatever emotional state you're in is probably the one they'll be in. If you go in a little uh, charged or happy and light, they'll probably be that way. So. Make a big point of what emotional state do you want your employees in, your vendors, your salespeople, your constituents in before you negotiate. Number two, in any negotiation, make sure, uh, uh, and I'm, uh, 
jumping back here a little bit, that you're negotiating with the decision maker. Ask that question. Are you the one that can sign this contract? Are you the one that can make this decision? No, I need to talk to my husband or wife. Well, we need to negotiate or communicate with them also. Um, so then you've gone back, you've built rapport, you've disarmed them, you've asked their why, and now let's get to where we are. Whatever number they say, you go silent, best negotiating tool in the world, and ask this, can you do any better? Can you do any better? Can you do any better? I'll usually ask that question until they can't take it anymore. Now, um, uh, you know, you've know, you got to be reasonable and you, gotta, you don't want to upset anybody, but are you willing to push it like a five or seven or a little bit to perhaps save maybe millions of dollars, depending on your business, hundreds of thousands, uh, weeks of time? Uh, most people rise up to the level of expectations you set. Let me say that again. Most people rise up or try to meet the level of expectation you set. So if you have an expectation to get this contract at 30% or 25% below what they're asking, are you willing to ask that question, can you do any better, what's the least you'll take and be okay? Seriously, what's the least you'll take and be okay and go silent? Now, um, then when they come down as far as they, they will, and they won't move anymore. They said, listen, I told you 750,000 seven times. Don't ask that question. Are you willing to push it a little bit? Are you willing to, to, to bend the envelope? And uh, what I do is then throw out an almost embarrassing low test number. That's right. Why not? You have nothing to lose. Now, what's the chance they could get upset? They could. We mentioned that earlier. Just like the five-year-old in the store who asked their mommy 20 times, why, 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 I want the PlayStation, why can't I get it? And finally the mommy or the daddy loses it. And if you ask it enough, your constituent, your negotiating person may get a little upset. And if they get upset, remember this. You can always stop the negotiation and reframe. That's changed the emotional state. As a matter of fact, because you're such a great group at Eno, I'm going to offer myself as your sacrificial lamb. You can blame it on me, and you can use humor. So let's say uh, next week you're in a negotiation, you're testing some of these methods, and you pushed it. You asked, can you do any better seven times, and your uh, business associate across the table lost it. He goes, I told you not to ask that, and you all asked it again and again, and they came down a little bit. They won't come down anymore, and you now, um, they get upset. The negotiation's gone bad, okay? Don't worry. Reframe. You stop the negotiation. Remember, whatever state you're in, they're probably going to be in. So you have to get a little happy. The best reframer is humor. Blame it on me and say, you know what? I was on this uh, webinar with this guy, Robert Sheeman. He told me to ask that question seven times. I knew it wouldn't work, and, you know, I asked it over and over again. And you got upset. You know, some of those webinars, I tell you, and you're laughing, and you're going, you know, the seminars are crazy, that Robert guy, blame it on me, whatever. And you laughed and, and, and maybe apologize a little bit and take your time, always take your time in negotiation. His or her mood changes, and uh, you've stopped the negotiation. Now you're laughing, uh, hopefully at my expense, and then you uh, go right back in the negotiation uh, when you're ready and when they're ready and say, but seriously, what would you take? Uh, now you've seen this before, but uh, are you using it? Are you willing to go over the edge a little bit? I'm not saying to really upset people, but in a serious negotiation, you've got to be willing to push it and perhaps stop and reframe. Now, what's the number one human motivator? Again, fear of loss. I know it sounds basic, uh, but pick me for the kickball team. Don't leave me out. We want to be part of this. If there's a way to introduce fear of loss into the negotiation, um, it, it's going to uh, motivate people. It works on uh, most people, even uh, intelligent uh, people that you wouldn't think it would work on, it does. Now, this is something I want to throw in that a lot of us forget. Negotiate on other stuff, service contracts, uh, bonuses. Uh, do you have any other business or referrals, um, any other business we can do together? Um, I know a lot of times uh, I do a lot of real estate negotiation, and I'll negotiate for furniture, cars, uh, equipment. Uh, there's always a better way. There's always other things you can do together uh, with some of these uh, uh, people you're negotiating with. And uh, don't be uh, afraid to get creative and take a moment and um, negotiate on some other stuff. I want you to always remember that I've actually made people literally millions of dollars just by saying, is there any other thing here that we could throw in, 
add in, get creative, creative finance, uh, term, service, all kinds of good stuff. But I can assure you that all of us leave a lot of things on the table. I want you to think about that um, and, and not do that in the future. Now I want to give you some bonuses here. And these are what I call RD, not research and development, but resistance destroyers. Highly effective. Now, I want you to, uh, and I know a lot of you do this because you're a, a very successful and very in tune with politics, the elections. Uh, I'm not going to talk about politics here, but uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of neuro-linguistic programming, which some of you have heard about, some of you may have studied, and uh, a lot of our great leaders uh, uh, use it. I won't mention any names, uh, but they uh, win a lot of elections, and they use some of these techniques. And I want you to be aware of them, and the best way to get good at something is practice. Um, resistance. Even right now, as I give you some of these tools and tips that you may know and will use or may not use, a lot of y'all are resisting me. You know, well, it's good. I like it. I may use it. I may not. I've heard this before. So I want to give you a very powerful tool to reduce almost all resistance in any negotiation. It's called time distortion. Now, it's, uh, you need to take your time when you do it. You need to practice. But right now, your critical factor is on. Uh, you're analyzing what I'm saying. In most negotiations you're in with very successful business people, they're critical factors on. They're listening to everything you say and taking it apart, analyzing it, agreeing, disagreeing, consciously and subconsciously. We want to get rid of that critical factor and go right into their decision-making process of the subconscious where 99% of all decisions are made. And one of the most effective tools to do that is this, time distortion. When you take people backwards and forward in time, their resistance almost goes to zero. Anytime you hear a, a great negotiator, politician, um, certain other great communicators, uh, different religious leaders, and uh, with respect to all of them, uh, tell a story, take people backwards and forward in time, they're using a very powerful tool to reduce resistance to almost zero. So in a business negotiation, you can give me any context to do this in, uh, you take them backwards in time uh, when they had a problem. And the more emotions and more senses you can use, the better. And then you take them forward in time. You know, George, uh, right now uh, we're negotiating uh, over uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars and you're deciding which client to go with. But imagine, you know, two years from now, the contract's been signed. We've been working together for two years. It's now 2014. The service has been better than you expected. The profits have been amazing for your company, our relationship. You know, the first six months, it was good. Then we uh, spent a lot of time together. Our staff got to know each other. Uh, we really got our communication even better. Then a year passed and two years. And you're sitting two years from now in the same office looking at the numbers, feeling fantastic. Things went better than you expected you know, on and on and on, and you're feeling great. And you don't even remember what the numbers of that contract were. And you look back and say, it all started here today when we agreed to get this contract signed. Let's get those terms out of the way. Let's agree to agree and move forward. Now, that was about 14 seconds of time distortion. I'd recommend doing minutes of it. Um, take people forward and backwards in time. Uh, use their emotions. Uh, as many senses as you can. Now, you've got to be uh, realistic, and you've got to watch them. Of course, the only rule of communication is how it affects the listener or the person you're attending it to. So you always got to be aware that you're not uh, taking them too far in the future or boring them, okay? But I want you to try it. Backwards in time when there was a bad situation or problem. Forwards in time where things are great. They've already signed the contract. They've taken the job. The business has grown. Uh, the relationship solid, how they're going to feel. And uh, literally as you're speaking to them in that uh, forward time, uh, their resistance is almost uh, in the right circumstances. If you have rapport and all the other things in place, gone down to zero. And here's another very powerful neurolinguistic programming tool that a lot of you may or may not be aware of. It's called embedded commands. Uh, your subconscious uh, cannot tell the difference between a lot of things. So let me give you a couple examples of this. And to give an embedded command, you would actually slow down on your sentence, maybe lower your voice a little bit, and give an embedded command. So I'll give you an example of this, and I want you to see if you catch me. Um, 
So let's say uh, I have one of your business like Andrew or Carol or Jonathan, and uh, I am uh, selling um, uh, computer services, uh, big contracts, and we're in the middle of a, a presentation, negotiation, persuasion, and uh, I'll say, well, and I'm negotiating with uh, Sandra, and we've talked for a while, and I say, Sandra, uh, we've talked a lot about the systems, the software, uh, the pricing. I think we've agreed on a lot of stuff, and by now, you realize that this would probably be uh, the software that will meet your needs. It will be good for your company. And uh, you realize that we've got a great relationship. We've been uh, working on this for a few months now. And by now, you understand that uh, this is probably a good decision for both of us. Now, what am I saying that's an embedded command? B-Y now or B-U-Y now? By now. Um, so um, sign the contract. You know, I was driving down the road, and there was the sign uh, that said, you know, you should do this. Now, I'm giving some very poor examples here, just kind of making them up. But be very careful about some great persuaders who use embedded commands. Um, uh, buy now. Uh, how about check this out, just like a checkout line is another one. And there's all types of them. So, uh, uh, embedded commands. Another one is the use of negatives. Uh, the subconscious can understand a positive or negative command. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, don't think about blue monkeys. Uh, whatever you do right now, do not think about blue monkeys. Don't think about blue monkeys now or even six weeks from now. Well, what's the only thing you can think about? Blue monkeys. You know, uh, uh, re a re resistance reducer is the negative uh, embedded commands, you know, like don't clean your room, uh, you know, don't think about doing your homework uh, to a child uh, because the subconscious cannot hear uh, a negative command. That's why most diets, 99% fail. Don't eat the cheesecake. Don't eat the cheesecake. Don't eat the cheesecake. What's the only thing your mind is thinking about? So I said I'd give you one bonus. Let me give you a couple more bonuses here for negotiation. Uh, this is something where if you have a big negotiation on a big contract, big money, big business, I'd really like you to try this. Uh, in advanced negotiations, we break up into teams where there's a speaker, so you're designated as the main speaker. There's an observer, and there's a listener to watch uh, and listen, and the observer watches all parties and takes notes. Um, after every meeting, after every negotiation, before and after, what you've learned in this presentation is set your intention for any meeting. Um, set your expectations. I know in business, I used to have meetings that were going for two or three hours, and now we set the intention. We've got 25 minutes. We're going to go over the budget, the accounting, the marketing. You've got five minutes. You've got seven minutes. Uh, set those expectations. Uh, then setting the speaker, observer, and listener, you ask people to come back and give feedback. Very important. Here's the point. Imagine after every communication that's important to you and your business and your life and every negotiation that's important, you stop and make a phone call and ask the person or in person and say, you know, we did some business, we had the meeting, we had the employee meeting, we had the family meeting. Is there anything uh, we could have done better or anything we did wrong um, or anything that we could have helped uh, with or done differently? And imagine uh, the progression of progress uh, that you're going to have the information to gather if after every uh, major meeting or negotiation, uh, whatever it is in your life or business, that you ask for feedback and ask the question, is there anything we can do better, different, how can we improve? Uh, not everyone will give it to you, but imagine over the next six months um, how uh, much improvement and feedback uh, you could get. I know after every major negotiation and presentation I do, we debrief, and I recommend you do the same, and I recommend that if you can, take someone with you, at least one person, to observe, watch, and uh, give positive uh, critique uh, to that negotiation to make you better and better and better. Now, this sounds silly, but it's very important. CV, it's not curriculum vitae, which is a resume in Europe. It celebrates your victories, even small ones. You know, you got the meeting. Set standards for everyone on your team, whether it's sales or marketing, uh, human resources, what uh, people are persuading and negotiating, employees, the vendors, the suppliers, the customers to do. Uh, we got the meeting. Let's celebrate. Give the person a recognition. Uh, you know, they negotiated a, a good uh, contract. Uh, the price negotiation went well. Um, so 
I challenge all of you all to really take time. I know you're busy. I know your people are involved in, in all types of persuasion, sales, negotiations. What are you doing to really celebrate them, to give them a recognition? It doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but you'll be amazed at the results you'll get uh, by uh, just celebrating the victories. Now, uh, we're not over yet. I'm just saying bye now. <laughs> uh, there's nothing here to sell. So uh, before we say bye, I want to do something that hopefully will help you and ask uh, you a couple of questions uh, for the Q&A, and that is um, intervention time, um, doctor persuasion. Maybe you can uh, type in on this Q&A some things. Uh, maybe you have a, a little situation. You're wondering about how to deal with uh, whether it's an employee, a vendor, salesperson, marketing, contract, or teenager. Um, if you have any questions about how some of these tools may be applied to that. And again, I want to challenge all of you uh, to take one or two or three of these concepts that you may have heard before, you may not have heard before, you may have learned, whether it's time distortion, uh, whether it's setting your intention, whether it's asking for feedback, and uh, use them uh, in the next uh, week, 20, 30 days, using that system of uh, the CIA, what I call the CIA system of uh, asking um, how motivated are they uh, from 0 to 10, why didn't they say a lower number, uh, having them do all the talking and, and persuading as opposed to you or I, and uh, use this stuff. But if you have any questions about um, what you've uh, been working on or uh, something, um, you can uh, type them in. And I see, do you have a strategy for identifying and resolving negotiations where getting what you want is simply not possible? Uh, that's very interesting. Let me say that again. That's a great question. Do you have a strategy for identifying and resolving negotiations where getting what you want is simply not possible? Now, that's interesting. Um, I actually have a book uh, uh, called, uh, it's not really published, it's published, but it's not out yet, and I love this question. I'm actually going to answer it. Uh, I wrote a book on uh, the quality of questions, and this question says it's simply not possible. And I'm going to submit to you that uh, I wouldn't ask the question that way. How do we make it possible? I've been involved in negotiations where I had no power, no reason to succeed, um, uh, giving, um, working with people that were insane, literally and figuratively, and went over the intention and said, I'm going to get them to do this, and I treat it as a fun game. And I want to ask the question is, uh, instead of saying that's simply not possible, the question is, how do we identify and resolve negotiations uh, where getting what we want uh, and, and how do we make it possible, even though it seems uh, challenging. So the question is, is number one, you, we all have to be realistic. And uh, you know, when you're going to negotiation, you need to know where you want to be and where they're going to be before you go into negotiation. So if you want to uh, do a contract for $10,000 and uh, they're demanding a million dollars and it's a million dollar piece of equipment and the most income can do is $800,000, you know, we have to have some dose of reality here, okay? Um, but I would say that uh, if you go with the intention of let's make this possible somehow, then all of a sudden all kinds of creative answers are going to come. So be very careful how we, before we go into a question or go into negotiation, how we frame the question because how we frame the question will uh, limit our answers. So we just had another one very interesting here. Um, when you're going back and forth in time, do you always keep it positive, or do you ever try spanking emotions with painting a negative scenario if they don't go with your way? The answer is absolutely. Because uh, in the, when you say in the past, I would definitely spend time on the pain, the problem, the difficulties, the more senses, the loss of time, energy, frustration. Yes. And then when you go forwards in time, when they do what you want them to do, how everything's resolved, how it's better. So there's got to be that pain-pleasure principle. As we know, that's the motivator, and pain is a much bigger motivator than pleasure, unfortunately or fortunately. So yes, you want to use those, uh, I don't want to say negative, but uh, the painful uh, scenario if they don't do what you're doing, uh, in the, especially in the past and that time to start. So that was a great um, question. Another one here, these are really good. Do you have specific strategies for negotiating compensations packages, especially for high-level key employees? Um, and yes, and I think that's about gathering information, uh, as we said before in negotiation. 
Um, who are they? What do they want? What's their family situation? Spouse, husband, wife, kids, schools, uh, relocation, um, people you know in the industry who know them, uh, finding out what really motivates them. As you know, in compensation, I know that we're all business people, and I think, hey, just give me the money. Send me a check. I don't want a T-shirt or any recognition. But money always comes as a second, third, or fourth motivation for most people. Um, and even though you have to be realistic and have to have your needs taken care of and you have to be competitive, so I would gather all that information. Um, I would also uh, ask them what they're expecting and ask them why. Where do they come up with that number? Well, the uh, chairman of General Motors is making $8 million a year. Yes, but you're applying for a marketing position at our 80-employee firm. You know, and, I, and I'm not kidding. People hear stuff and come up with stuff that's absolutely insane. So I would, on the compensation on any negotiation, find out what their expectations are and where they came from, that why, why, why. Um, I think that you'll always be amazed, and even though these people are very intelligent, sometimes their expectations are not. Uh, we had another one. Um, I'm going, starting to do a lot of business outside the U.S., Latin America, Middle East, and Europe. What would you recommend for me to negotiate with the companies in these cultures? That's a great question. Every culture is different. I think every state in America can be different. Um, I'm right now calling you from Israel, um, and there's generalizations that are true uh, about certain areas. Uh, I've worked a lot in Latin and South America, and it's all about relationships. You have to go to lunch, dinner, talk about family, be relaxed. If you're in a rush, you will be frustrated and develop that very personal relationship. That's so important to them. And again, there's exceptions to everything I'm saying. In the Middle East, and please don't say I said this, but I'll say it because this is what I've heard. A lot of people in the Middle East in certain countries, and every country is different and every person is different. Um, one of the top leaders here uh, in the Middle East told me, we come from a uh, culture of mistrust. And if you look at the history and background, some people might be able to understand that, culture of mistrust. So, uh, you know, understand that that's a difference. That's where some of the people you might be negotiating with come from. Also, again, relationships, uh, very important as in anywhere. Europe, uh, I've worked in Europe. Every country is different. You know, France, again, you may have to go have lunch for two or three hours, which as a business person drives me crazy. I don't want to eat lunch. Uh, let's do the business. Let's get the deal done. But you've got to be very careful. Their culture, their relationships. I'd also, uh, gift giving, again, has to be legal uh, under your ethics rules, can be very, very important. Um, I know in America, family is important, but in a lot of other cultures, family uh, tap ties are super important. Um, and, uh, you know, respect. So you really got to do your homework, and I would really spend a lot of time. I would also uh, take some time and trouble to understand what, um, what their expectations of you are. Uh, what do they think of Americans or if you're from another country? Uh, and I deal with that right up front. Um, like here in the Middle East, a lot of people think Americans are weak and silly and uh, we, um, you know, don't get to the point and we're too polite and we won't tell them no. So I deal with that right up front. Uh, just like any negotiation, take that weakness or that expectation and extinguish it, um, uh, get rid of it. We have just a few more minutes here. These are great questions. I, I wish I had more time to answer all of them. But um, is any thoughts on dealing with a strong personalities who are very successful in driving agenda, dominating process, and don't consider suggestions? Um, this question is under assumption where you cannot just walk away. And, you know, walking away is a, is, it's a good one in some situations, but here you can't. And uh, the suggestion I would give on this is the strong personalities. Every personality is a multi-personality. And um, if they're a driver, talk to them in their language and let them know right up front, just like that CIA negotiating, hey, you're in control. You're uh, absolutely in control of the situation. And, um, and uh, um, let them know that. Let them relax into that. Now, they don't consider suggestions. So instead of saying uh, direct approach, and this will help everybody in every negotiating system, it's called softening the question. So instead of saying, you know, you don't consider suggestions. You, you know, you're a driver and you don't listen to anybody, which we probably want to say, I would um, tell a story. Anytime you tell a story, third party, it softens it. You know, um, 
you know, you're very good at what you do. You're very powerful, very uh, successful. And uh, you know, it was interesting. Uh, we were in a meeting the other day, and someone said uh, there was someone in there who, you know, just wouldn't listen to suggestions. Now, I'm not doing a very good example of this, but I'm putting a third party, a movie, a book, um, and ask the question that way. What would you tell that person in that situation? Now, you, you know, it could be too obvious or too trite or too superficial, but it's a softener. Instead of asking directly, you know, why won't you take suggestions, use a third-party story, a book or study. You know, successful business say that they do or take suggestions. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, no way, never going to do it. Then you have to deal with what you have to deal with. Um, and some people um, will not change. But I find that people are like books. And even the toughest, meanest, uh, hardest people have some area where they will soften. It could be their family, their grandchild, their hobby. And that's where I want to go and uh, find their core values. And remember, whatever people are shouting out the most, I'm strong, really means that they're the weakest. I want you to really understand what I just said. Whatever they're shouting out the loudest, look how great I am, look how powerful I am, really probably means that actually uh, deep down inside they're actually uh, a very, um, very weak. So um, I'll do one more of these questions. I think we have to wind up. Um, any suggestions on negotiating with the big guys? We are at four uh, dollar, <laughs> four, four million uh, company being approached. Um, uh, you know, with, with with huge, huge companies. And I think size and power and success are all a mindset um, because you are growing. You are a big uh, company. Uh, you have huge potential. Uh, you're working with big clients. And I, I would never, now you can't be ego or, or, or be someone you're not, but I think we all in every situation underrate ourselves. You have a lot of experience. You have unbelievable technology. You have an amazing staff. You have amazing systems. Um, look for your strengths and uh, focus on that. Uh, one last one uh, before we wind up. Can you please read clarify embedded commands? I did not catch in its entirety. My apologies for that. Embedded commands are in the middle of a sentence uh, when you have rapport, when you have a relationship with them. You can't just throw out a command embedded. It goes into the subconscious. So a couple of examples I gave were you're talking, talking, talking. You're trying to get them to buy your uh, uh, computers or software. And you would say, um, you know, uh, we've been uh, in these uh, meetings for two or three months. They're going well. And you probably realize, and you lower your voice and pause a little bit and say, buy now that we have a good relationship, and uh, you realize that we have a, uh, a good uh, services for you, and we could do a lot of great things together, and by now, you understand that uh, this could be a great thing. I'm not saying B-U-Y. I'm, say, I'm not saying B-Y by now. I'm saying B-U-Y. Check this out. Um, sign this. Um, uh, it's an embedded command in the middle of the sentence. Uh, that they don't really catch. It goes right in their subconscious. And that also goes another uh, negotiating technique that uh, we talk about, which is called uh, the assumed um, assumption, the assumptive close you've heard, just assuming that, you know, after we do this and after the contract side, we're going to be having dinner. It's going to be great. Now, you can't be cocky or too ego, but it does work. And inside those are a lot of embedded commands. You know, after the contract signed, uh, um, after you uh, uh, do the deal, um, inside sentences where it's not as obvious as it might seem. Those are embedded commands. So, um, you know, it's not what you heard. It's not what you know. It's not what you learn. It's what you do. And I really hope you take just a couple of these principles and practice them. Some of you have heard before, but use them. And I'd love to have your feedback on how uh, I could serve you or uh, anything we could do better. And um, I'll go ahead and give you my personal email, which I normally don't do, but I respect the uh, entrepreneurs organization and joy and all these educational benefits you get. Uh, mastermind groups uh, like you're in are probably the best way to uh, be successful. I'm in quite a few myself, so I want to congratulate all of you and be part of such a great group. Um, and it's uh, amazing to have such a successful international group of really uh, amazing business people uh, getting together. My personal email, and if I can help you in any way, let me know, is Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T, at Sheeman Wealth, that's S-H-E-M-I-N, wealth.com, W-E-A-L-T-H.com, Robert at Sheeman Wealth.com, S-H-E-M-I-N, wealth.com. That's my personal email. 
I will be flying all day tomorrow, but I'll get back to you in a, couple, a day or two. And uh, my website is robertsheeman.com, which uh, um, is uh, fairly basic, but it's out there, robert at sheemanwealth.com. I want to uh, thank all you all for being here, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, I know all of you are great persuaders and communicators. If not, you wouldn't be where you are. But I always want you to ask yourself, uh, you know, how can we do it better? Um, how can we be more efficient? Uh, setting that intention, setting that commitment, um, and using a few of these tools. I want to wish all of you all a lot of success. And the other thing, uh, another key to negotiation and business is I know you have a lot of uh, serious things you deal with every day, but the more relaxed you are, the more fun you have, uh, I think the better things go when we're stressed out in a negotiation or communication. Things just don't go, just seem, seem to go that well. And uh, I think all of us, the more we breathe, the more we relax, take a few minutes, set that intention, and one can be, this is going to be a great communication, great persuasion, a great meeting. We're going to get the contract. We're going to have fun doing it. We're going to have a great time working together. Um, and if you can do that, I think things will always go better. So uh, once again, uh, thanks to your great group, and I want to wish you all a lot, a lot of success. Stay well. Enjoy it all. Thank you, Robert. That was really good. Um, thank you all for participating as well. Um, if you can take a moment, there a survey did pop up on your screen. Please uh, take a moment to fill that out and give some feedback. And if you did miss Robert's email, um, it will be sent to you in a post email along with the recording of this session. Thank you all again and have a great day.